realize it's never going to go away. It's it's a very different. It's a very different. 2 a.m. is a dark hour. I can tell you that. <laughs> Welcome back to my mental health and crime channel. My name is Hudra London. This is the case of the Ido quadruple murders that took place on the 13th of November, 2022. May the four victims rest in peace. Condolence to their families. We are still waiting for the forensic evidence to be turned over to the defense attorney of Brian Christopher Koberger so that we can find out exactly how the prosecutors have come to this conclusion that it is Brian Christopher Koberger that actually was the one that went into 1122 Kings Road and did this horrific quadruple murders. This was a article put up in Facebook by someone who knows Jack Sh John Schwalter in Boise, Idaho. I've explained this before and she wanted to help with this case and she saw she came across John Jack Shawalter hoodie guy in the grub truck video and she wanted to give her feedback of something that she has experienced basically stalking behaviors harassing behaviors towards females towards her and a friend that worked in the same restaurant as Shawalter I know that many people allegedly believed from the beginning that John Schwalter could have been involved in the quadruple murders. Although he was ruled out, there's many things of John Jack Schwalter's behaviors that are still in question. I'm sure he had a pretty good alibi to be ruled out. But I don't think that really anyone was checked properly from the beginning. Even Kaylee Gongav's his father, Steve, believes that many people have been ruled out too early. This is what the girl wrote on Facebook. So this is her experience with him. Allegedly, he comes across to be very disrespectful to women, female, and how he speaks to them. He was kicked out of his fraternity, Delta Tau, dealt for bad behaviors towards females and he was allegedly harassing Maddie and Kaylee that night in the corner club. He was thrown out for harassing females. Whether it was Kaylee and Maddie or if it was two other females, he was harassing someone. He's very skilled in hunting we saw the picture where there was two K-bar K -bar knives in front of him, one in his hand and one on the floor. And he seemed to be very upset when the girls left him in the grub truck. There were three unidentified male DNAs found there. So I wonder where Sir Walter was at that time of the crimes. He drove 2 a.m. in the morning to Boise, Idaho, 
to his family's cabin that is almost six hours away from Ido, Moscow. Was he drunk when he was driving? Was he sober? Was he any form of driving? What car did he drive? This girl had to literally slap him, slap Jack Showalter to get him to move. He was calling them the dumb B word. Has Hoodie Guy been in 1122 Kings Road? It's kind of strange. He seems to know the girls well. And I wonder if he knew Murphy the dog. I believe it was someone who knew the girls. And Eaton. I believe all four were the targets. And I believe there's a motive to it, or a couple of motives. The timeline was originally 3 to 4 a.m.
Maddie seems to be upset. She pointed her finger to Jack Schwalter. Burger case because this is something we haven't focused on in a little bit and we really should as we know the 28 year old former criminology student is charged with four counts of first degree murder and burglary in connection with the brutal slayings of four university of idaho, idaho students back in november of 2022 daily gonsalves madison mogan zahner Cronodal, and ethan chapin and we are all anticipating what the prosecution is going to present in Koberger's upcoming preliminary hearing which is scheduled for the week of June 26th. As we know, preliminary hearings are the opportunity for the prosecution to present evidence of probable cause, probable cause that he committed these crimes, all in support of these charges, all so that this case can ultimately proceed to trial. That's the purpose of a preliminary hearing. This is the prosecution's burden to basically show their hand. But as we know, the defense cross-examine these witnesses, the state's witnesses, maybe even present their own evidence. So it's really interesting. So as we wait for all that, there have now been some recent developments that I want to get into. And that brings me right now to retired FBI agent and attorney, Bobby Chacon. Bobby, so good to see you. Friend of the program. Haven't seen you at Sidebar in quite some time, so it's good to have you back. It's good to be back, Jesse. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so let's start with the major development. The major development regarding Bethany Funk. Bethany Funk was one of the two surviving roommates in that house. She was in the house when the killings happened in the early morning hours of November 13th. Now, Koberger's defense originally subpoenaed her to appear at the preliminary hearing. But then both sides agreed to quash that subpoena because Funk has agreed to be interviewed by the defense in Reno, Nevada, where she lives. Now, the question is, why do they want to speak with her? Well, according to an affidavit uh, that was filed by the defense, the defense's criminal investigator, Richard Batanti, wrote, quote, Bethany Funk has information material to the charges against Mr. Koberger. She was interviewed by police on several occasions. She disclosed things she heard and things she saw. Portions of information Ms. Funk has is exculpatory to the defendant. Ms. Funk's information is unique to her experiences and cannot be provided by another witness. Wow. Okay, so Bobby, as we know, exculpatory means information that would show Brian Koberger's innocent. What do you make of that? Well, yes, it does, that's exactly what exculpatory means. However, the, the, the interpretation of whether a piece of testimony is exculpatory or not is, is very open to interpretation. And so while the investigator says she has... Um, things or, or stuff that is exculpatory to Brian Koberger, that's their interpretation of that, whatever that be. So, so you know, arguably, in a case like this, in this case in particular, she is a, you know, probably the most important witness. She's the only living eyewitness, if you want to call her an eyewitness, to the crimes that happened. So she, well, well, also we have Dylan Mortensen, who's the other surviving roommate. She's the one who allegedly saw the killer um so it's you know that's a very right, yeah. so both, of, both yeah. of these people in the house are really the only two eyewitnesses it is so to speak and so they the defense is going to want to get into them as much as they can they want to you know what we call dirty them up if they can at trial and anything that they can get to before trial helps them so any statement so it, as part of the discovery process that the, the defense gets all of the statements that this witness has made to the police, uh, you know, in, in any way. And so they review those statements now, and they want to talk more at length about those things to this witness. 
Um, it, 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 before before uh, cross examination, because I've, I've had it where in my own statements where defense litigators will get into the littlest detail that you give and try to make you give an inconsistent statement prior to trial so they can bring that out of trial as an inconsistent statement and maybe look like your memory is bad or you're lying or you really don't know what you're talking about. That's particularly important in cases of like height. I've seen it done in height where the person says, the witness will say, the guy was about five foot eight. And then the police say, well, could he have been five foot eight or five foot ten? And the person says, well, yeah, he could have been five foot eight, five foot nine, five foot ten in that area. And then the defense says, well, if he could have been five eight or five ten, could he have been six foot or six one? And then you've got somebody from five eight to six one, and they dirty up a witness that way, and then the witness's recollection looks really unreliable. And so in this case, I think what they want to do is they want to get into some of the details of what they told police and try to create seemingly inconsistencies. When they were fighting the subpoena, basically said, quote, um, that this is without support, there's no further information or detail, and they're basically kind of, you know, watering down what information she has. But here's what we do know. Here's what we do know, Bobby, that she and this other roommate, Dylan Mortensen, were inside that residence at the time of the killings, that they were roommates to the victims. We believe that uh, Ms. Funk was in the first floor bedroom. According to the probable cause affidavit that, you know, came out when they ultimately arrested Brian Koberger, um, according to Funk, uh, she saw Ethan Chapin and Zonica Kernobyl at a fraternity house from approximately 9 p.m. on November 12th to 1.45 a.m. on November 13th. She also estimated that at approximately 1.45, both Chapin and Kernodal returned to the residence. Um, she also stated that Chapin didn't live in the King Road residence, which we know he was a guest of Kernodal. Um, And she also said, in, or it was also said in this probable cause affidavit, that Funk and Mortensen both told police that the other occupants of the home returned back November 13th at around 2 a.m. and that they were asleep or at least in their rooms by approximately 4 a.m. But there's one other thing. In the probable cause affidavit, apparently police reviewed forensic downloads from Funk's phone and determined that the homicides occurred between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. So, so that's important information about the timeline. Remember, according to this cr criminal investigator, that whatever information Funk has, it's unique to her. Is there anything about that, the fact that she's so instrumental in putting the timeline that the defense is trying to chip away at? Because if they can say the killings didn't happen at these times, or her timeline's wrong, that may help Brian Koberger. Sure, it may help him, but it's hard to see how that could be exculpatory. In other words, it, it, you know, unless they're prepared to prove that Brian Koberger was somewhere else at that time, if they can say, oh, well, it, it must have happened between here and here, but we have proof that Brian was over here at that time, that can conceivably be exculpatory. But oftentimes the defense will say something like, well, this proves that there might have been somebody else in the house or something like that. And that's not necessarily exculpatory. You know, if, if there's somebody else involved in the crime, that's not necessarily exculpatory to this defendant. They might be able to, they might be trying to say that, you know, you have video of his Elantra in a certain place at a certain time, and if the crimes happened here, how could he have been in that house when his Elantra is on video over here at that time? So they're, they're trying to, you know, play with the timeline, and they think, they may think they have something like that where, you know, if you're saying this is him and this Elantra, which we're going to say it is, well, then the times don't match because the Elantra's on video over here. And now I, I don't agree that that's what the timeline shows, but that may be the line that they're going down. I find this to be very interesting. Could it be possible that Bethany Funk knew where Brian Christopher Koberg was that night? Would that make sense? Because she has something, a portion of material that is unique compared to Deer. So was Brian maybe talking to Bethany? Or was she 
a witness to where he was? The reason I have to say this mindfully. The reason I don't, I do not believe BF and DM is if they did what was right, right as lawful, obedient citizens, and called nine one one immediately. Oh, it's okay. Don't even call nine one one immediately. Just say you were in shock. What about calling nine one one in three hours, five hours? And then on top of that, they managed to call the Sigma boys, Hunter Johnson, Eaton, his brother, may rest in peace. They called the whole world, except the police. The police were the last people to find out. In fact, 911, the ambulance was the first ones notified after the multiple people came and called 911. Another thing that I don't understand is, I'm a mental health counselor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, I'm sure there are plenty of people in the medical field there who could answer this. Wouldn't you notice the difference between an unconscious person and a person who has been bleeding out trigger warning for eight hours? I believe that DM and BF have crucial information. And Ann Taylor, Ann Taylor has every right to bring them up, up. Another thing is, if they were genuine about their testaments, the prosecution would have let them spoke. They wouldn't have sealed the files and subpoenaed it and all this. Why? Everyone's entitled to a fair trial. Up to today, I've never said that I don't believe that BK hasn't done the crime. I'm not saying that BK has done it either. I'm just saying, show us the proof. There's so many things that are missing in this puzzle that until the trial starts and until they're genuine with the trial, now we have the prosecutor, Thompson, and his crew fighting against cameras to be brought in the court.